Welcome to episode E002 of VLearnX. Let me introduce myself, I am Jim Cathode. I run this show. Our expert in science and technology, Tiffany Spectrum is also with us. Hello everyone. What do we discuss today? Let me show you something. In this video, we will explore how to synthesize music like this using the additive synthesis technique we learned in the previous episode. Here is the plan for today. First step is to understand how keys are mapped to different frequencies in a music keyboard. We will explore the motivation behind such a mapping. This is directly related to the tuning scheme. Next step is to explore a key notation scheme that considers various parameters of a key press. This will allow us to represent music as text data. Then we will use that notation to play a few short music pieces. What about the requirements for today's session? Same as before. Basic knowledge in Python and NumPy is all you need. Before we continue, let me remind everyone that I am not an expert in music theory or music synthesis. You should not take anything I do as a standard or a common practice. Instead, treat them as experiments. Let's start with a simple problem. Imagine a piano or a music keyboard. What scheme can we use to map all of its keys to frequency values? It might sound a bit stupid. I thought our aim is to create music using Python. Why do we care about what is going on with music keyboards? The keyboard here is just for visualization. The important thing is to identify the points on the frequency axis, which we can use for music. These points remain the same for most instruments. I understand now. How about starting with a frequency and add multiples of a constant value? Like arithmetic progression? Any other ideas? If we are trying arithmetic progression, we should also try geometric progression. And? I can't think of anything else. I have one more question. Last week you said that the tones produced by instruments have multiple frequencies in it. Then how is it possible to map one key to a single frequency? You are right. When we say frequency, we are considering the fundamental frequency, not the frequency of the harmonics. Take a look at this function. It produces tones of various frequencies based on arithmetic and geometric progressions. Here you can see the starting frequency for both cases. Notice the use of this variable and how it is updated. This is the update step for AP. Notice that we are adding a constant 20 Hz in every step. And this is the update step for GP. Somewhere in the middle, we make a big jump so that we can understand how the scheme works for both lower and higher frequencies. Then we combine those sounds and save it as a WAV file. We will go into the details of this sequence direct function later. Let me run this function and show you the output. This is what frequencies in AP sounds like. Could you play that again? Very interesting. It seems adding a frequency like 20 Hz has very little effect for higher frequencies. I think whatever we add should grow proportionally with the frequency. And that makes it a GP. Could you play the output of GP? Here you go.
Yes. This sounds like they are going up in equal steps. Why is that? Perception of pitch is a complicated topic and involves many parameters. I don't think we can explore that now. But as a simple model for music sounds, we can safely assume that it follows a logarithmic response. That is why a geometric progression of frequencies is perceived as an equal step progression of pitch. Here is a function to map keys to its frequencies. Before I explain this code, let me show you a photo with a few details. Here is the photo of a piano. I have added some notes to show how keys are grouped. It also shows some calculations. The frequency axis is divided into several sections, each spanning an octave. What is an octave? An octave is the interval between a given frequency f and 2f. For example, 100 Hz to 200 Hz is an octave. 200 Hz to 400 Hz is another octave. An octave is further divided into 12 semitones. Each of them is directly mapped to a key. Why 12? And why are some keys black? They are really good questions. At this point, I cannot give an answer since I am yet to explore those topics. What we see here is based on the Western music theory. It is possible that other cultures use more than 12 frequency points within an octave. I have no more information on this. That is fine. I have something to search as a homework. Please continue. In the past, the frequencies within an octave used to be selected using tuning schemes that rely on small integer ratios. Then came the equal temperament system, where adjacent frequency points follow a constant ratio. This means they follow a strict geometric progression. Now let's go back to that function. Here we set the frequency of the first key. These are the key names. For each octave, for each key, we find its frequency using this formula. And we fill the key map with that frequency. Finally, that key map is returned. We should see the print results once we run this code. Notice that the frequency values jump by a factor of 2 for every octave. It is easy to notice for the key A. Let me show you the plot of frequency values. Notice that we are plotting values after taking log. As expected. A straight line. That function is called here to initialize this global variable. We can use it whenever we have to convert keys to frequencies. Take a look at this file. We have created a key notation scheme for today's session. Each time step or frame is represented by a vertical bar. Multiple keys can be triggered in one frame. How to interpret those values? Let me guess. First number is the octave. Second is the name of the key. What are the remaining values? They are duration and volume. Both are optional. Here is the function to parse such a key notation. This function returns a tuple with these values. Next is this function. It maps the octave and the key to the corresponding frequency. Then returns a size 3 tuple. Notice that the volume mapping is not linear. These are the results for a few example keys. Finally, we come to the part where we make music. The starting point is a text file like this. It contains the handwritten score of the well-known music piece for Elise, composed by Beethoven. 
we need to read and parse this file. Then generate tones, combine them, and write it to a WAV file. Let's see how it is done. We start with the generate music function. It calls text to wave. That function is defined here. Here we are reading from the text file while removing the comments. In this step, the function converts the entire file data into a list of frames. Each frame is a list of keys. There are two splits to be made. One for the frame and one for the keys within a frame. This is the split for frames. And this is the split for the keys. It is needed since multiple keys can be triggered in a single frame. Next, we have to convert the list of frames into one long array of samples corresponding to the music. This is the function for that. For each frame, we run this loop, for each key in that frame. We convert the key as shown here. Then map the output from the previous step into frequency, duration, and volume. Remember the additive synth function we saw in the last episode? We use that in this step to produce the samples corresponding to the key. It returns a vector of samples. In this step, we sequence all the frames to produce the final music samples. Here is the function to stack all the frames. Important thing to consider is that the key sounds can last longer than the time step of one frame. Next, for each frame, we combine all the vectors in that frame. Note that the variable VecList stands for a frame. We need to keep track of the max size. At the end of this loop, we will use this value to define the length of the return vector. In this loop, we add up all the vectors in each frame. Finally, the combined vector is returned. It looks straightforward. Your comment seems to suggest that this function could be improved. What is wrong with this function? This function is adding vectors without considering the keys that generated them. This can cause problems when the same key is triggered in successive frames, as it could lead to destructive interference in some cases. The combined vector of samples comes back to this point. After that, we write it as a WAV file. Would you like to hear what the output sounds like? Sure, just give it a go. Very interesting. Do you have anything more? I do. I have composed a piece of music. Would you like to hear it? I am probably going to regret hearing it. But go ahead, make my day. This is the handwritten score of my music. Here I am changing the number of samples per time step. It has to go a bit faster.
That was not as bad as I imagined. I would like to try it too, at some point. The code will be available in GitHub, if you want to play with it. That's all I have for today. What's the topic for the next session? I have some ideas to generate music from randomness. That sounds good. Thank you Tiffany. We have used several public domain resources in this session. Here are the credits for that. And special thanks to everyone who advised us regarding the making of this episode. That's it for this session. The scripts we used are available publicly in GitHub. I will provide the link in the video description. See you again in the next episode. Thank you for your time.